then we can rule that out. That's not one of the possibilities. Rashes are really hard, by the way. They're very subtle, the differences, and it's hard to, to figure them out. So, preventing the spread of disease. Um, primary prevention, immunization. And I know there are some families who are concerned about immunization. Immunizations are not without risk. In every case, so the risk of contracting the illness and having a severe illness is higher than the risk of complications from the, taking the immunization. Um, so that is true. There are some complications or there are some risks, but not getting immunized is a greater risk. And hopefully we can convince families of that. And then we want to control the spread of the disease. So we can reduce cross-contamination when we're going from one patient to another by hand washing. And at Children's Hospital, their policy is gel in and gel out. So every time you walk in a room, you gel in. Every time you leave the room, you gel out. And then we follow any other posted isolation because as we saw, many of these will have, um, if they can be transmitted airborne, they're gonna have stricter isolation. Another common thing is pink eye, conjunctivitis. Um, now in newborns, they may look like conjunctivitis, oh, or well, in newborns, brand new newborns, usually what it is, well, what they have causing it is something they contracted as they went through the birth canal, um, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, or herpes, herpes simplex virus. In an infant, this is what I was starting to say earlier, it may actually be a clogged tear duct. Um, in newborns, they automatically put an ointment in the eyes to, to in case of chlamydia or gonorrhea. Um, with an infant, if they're showing signs of kind of chronic pink eye, we can teach the family to put a warm compress on the eye and massage the tear duct, and often it will clear up on its own. In older kids, it's usually bacterial. Now, it could be a virus. They get a cold and it gets into the eye, the conjunctiva. It could be allergic, just stuff floating in the air makes your eyes all red and irritated, or a foreign body, an eyelash, a piece of dust. The problem is in kids, if they've got something in their eye or they've got a viral infection going on, it itches, they rub it with their hands that they've been out playing in the dirt with, and they end up with a bacterial conjunctivitis because they added in the, the bacteria after. So most of the time it is going to end up bacterial regardless of how it started. So because of that, we're going to put an antibiotic in there. And this is usually an eye drop or on younger kids, an eye ointment. Um, the ointment makes your vision a little blurry for a little while. So older kids don't, <laughs> don't tolerate that very well unless you put it in at bedtime, but it's usually multiple times a day and then remove the secretions. And that's one thing with conjunctivitis as opposed to an allergic or a foreign body is they will have thick, crusty secretions. When they wake up in the morning, their eyes will be glued shut with dried secretions. You may have to use a, a warm washcloth to moisten up, loosen up those secretions before you can really even clean them off. And that's very much a sign that it's bacterial when you have that thick secretion. Here's a, a picture, and really the way to tell, we're talking about conjunctivitis, um, not the, the sclera, so pulling down the lower eyelid and looking on the inside of the under of the bottom eyelid, that's where the, that's the conjunctiva, and that's what should be red and inflamed, and then the rest of the eye gets red and inflamed as well. Okay, intestinal parasitic diseases. Um, this can be identified in a fresh stool specimen and we'll send down a bit of stool and usually they want a walnut sized amount of stool and they'll, that's for O and P, for ovum and parasites. So they're looking for the parasite as well as at the, an earlier stage, whether for a cyst or, um, you know, some earlier stage of it. One of the card, one of the common ones is Giardia, causing Giardia. Giardiasis, I thought it was itis, giardiasis. 
And the problem with Giardia is it has a cyst stage. If you go camping in the mountains and you boil your water, you'll kill all the live Giardia, but you won't kill the cysts. And cysts, they can survive in the environment for months. Almost all our water around here, even very high up in the mountains, has Giardia in it. It's from animal uh, feces. The animals have it, and their feces gets washed into the lakes and streams, even very high up, where you're talking about snow melt water. Well, the animals poop on the snow, and the snow melts and washes it in. So it is a, a problem around here. So first of all, tell parents, don't let your kids drink water from streams and lakes and rivers. Um, transmission can be between people, from animals, from contaminated water, and once it's at a daycare, it spreads very quickly, the person-to-person -person route. The medication we use for it is typically Flagyl. Um, also, your book also says Tinidazol. Uh, then another common one is pinworms, enterobiasis. I think. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I call it pinworms. And pinworms, these you ingest or inhale the eggs. The eggs hatch and then the pregnant female actually comes outside the anus, lays the eggs right around the anal uh, opening there, which itches. And so the child scratches and now has the eggs on their hand and, you know, sticks their thumb in their mouth to suck on their thumb and reinfects himself um, or touches something else and you know passes them on to, to others. Uh, the, your book suggests the best way to diagnose this um, is by the tape test. It says to put a piece of tape right around the rectum at night so that when the female comes out and lays the eggs the tape picks up the eggs I say good luck getting a child to sleep all night with a piece of tape over their rectum. But if the, you know, if they can, great. But probably that's going to itch and they're going to scratch the tape right off. So if a parent goes in first thing in the morning before the child's awake and takes the te takes that piece of tape and dabs the sticky side all around the rectum to pick up the eggs, and then you take that tape in to the. Um, to their health care provider and they'll look for the eggs. Now the medication for this is Vermox um, and Mebendazol I guess is the uh, generic name for that. And here you can see how easily in the daycare it is for these things especially Giardia to spread. We said they have a cyst that can last for months and you've got every child being changed on the same changing table there. And here's the life cycle of the pinworm. You ingest the egg, that you, it turns into a larva in the small intestine, an adult down in the large intestine, the pregnant female comes out and lays the eggs at the anus where you scratch them, and then reinfect yourself. Uh, ingestion of injurious agents. Most of the time when a child takes something that's dangerous, drinks you know, bleach or lighter fluid or whatever. Ninety percent of the time this occurs in their house. Um, the immediate treatment, you want to call the Poison Control Center. And not everything should be thrown back up. Some things that are very caustic and do damage going down will do damage coming back up. And so it's better to find a way to neutralize it as opposed to bring it back up. And for that reason, we no longer recommend syrup of, of Epicac. It, that's something we used to tell parents to keep in the house. So if the child ingested something that they shouldn't, you have them drink the syrup of Epicac and make them throw up. Well, depending on what it is, that may not be a good idea. So it's better to call the Poison Control Center and follow whatever their recommendations are. Sometimes, you know, They'll, if the child comes to the emergency room, sometimes the treatment will be a gas, gastric lavage. Um, so we're washing out the stomach, basically. We'll usually shoot in some 
saline and suck it back out to, and hopefully get out the infectious agent, or not infectious, the, the injurious agent along with it. Usually, more often, what they'll do is activate a charcoal. So if the child has to drink this charcoal substance, what it does is it absorbs the injurious agent that the child had. So now um, that agent is no longer just loose and doing damage to the, the stomach and intestinal walls. It's absorbed into the charcoal. The problem is the charcoal is extremely constipating and you don't pass it through very well. So then we have to give a cathartic as well to stimulate the bowels. And we also want to slow down the time that that injurious agent is inside of the, the intestines. So um, that's the other reason for the cathartic, to speed it up, get it out. Some things have an antidote where, you know, if you've had one thing, you take something else to neutralize it. So that's why it's best to call the poison control center first. Lead poisoning. Uh, anymore, we have pediatricians will check children for lead levels because you really don't know there are no symptoms of lead poisoning until the levels are very high and you start having um, side effects from it which are no longer treatable. The most common reason kids get lead poisoning is from peeling lead paint, lead-based paints. And it's not just that the child will eat the lead paint, but it can make lead dust that gets on the floor and the child gets it on their hands and gets it in their mouth. So they are ingesting it, but it can be, um, you know, not just chunks of paint. It's the lead is there as the paint peels off. Lead is also in our soil. Microparticles of lead are in contaminated soil and kids love to play out in the dirt. Um, it can be inhaled as well as ingested. So if you have a house with old lead paint and they're doing work on the walls that dust with the lead paint in it, you inhale it and you've just gotten you know, lead in, inside of you. Now the lead affects a number of systems. The renal system, the hematologic system, so your blood, neurologic system, um, your brain and developing brain nervous system are especially vulnerable. So lead poison diagnosis, rarely are there symptoms, so we have to do blood sampling. And if they, the child is more than the 10 micrograms per deciliter, there's a problem. It should be done, a, a physician should screen for lead at ages one and two years old when they go to their well visits. The treatment is chelation therapy, and this is with calcium disodium editate, or EDTA is what people usually call it. Um, there's also another one which is DMSA. And you give the chelation therapy, it binds to the lead, and the child's able to then you know, get rid of the lead. The problem is the lead is absorbed into uh, the tissues, so when you take it out of the bloodstream, what's in the, the tissues will move from the tissue into the bloodstream. So even though you've done the chelation therapy, the lead level doesn't go down. So you have to keep doing it until the lead level does finally go down, which may take multiple treatments because, like I said, it's out in the tissue. And when you take it out of the blood, it moves from the tissue into the blood and keeps that level high. Now the problem with lead poisoning is it does damage to the brain, CNS damage, that once that damage is done, it cannot be reversed. And um, so these kids are going to end up in, you know, special education because they can't learn as well as they would have been able to otherwise. And here's just kind of a picture showing the different systems. The hematologic system, it interferes with heme. Uh, and you end up anemic, it interferes with the renal system, damages the tubules, uh, changes, um, well, causes proteinuria and ketonuria and, and decreased vitamin K, or, sorry, vitamin D. It also has the neurologic sy symptoms and the re 